now we are set. Um, good morning again, everyone. The next talk um, is called Economics of Volunteer Labor, and it's held by Ashish Laroy. Enjoy. Thanks. So uh, I'm going to tell you the three stories from Debian, trying to uh, orient you to a few, th a few theories that I have about how economics work in volunteer labor of free software production. And I should actually tell you first, this is a short version of a talk I gave two months ago at a US conference called Open Source Bridge. And I submitted it to DevConf because I thought, if I'm going to be talking about Debian, I might as well tell Debian what I'm saying about Debian. So, uh, so that's why part of the very Twittery opening, because that's common in the US, not at DevConf. So, uh, yeah, actually, before I begin, uh, there's a note-taking exercise later in the talk. Does anyone have a pen they can lend me? Thanks. Oh, great, thank you. Great, okay. So, uh, there's three, there's going to be three important takeaways I hope that you will leave this talk with. The first is the idea of the difference between collaboration and cooperation. Uh, the second is the idea that we're not all altruists when we work on Debian, and this is important to understanding how to help us, how to get other people to do things. And the third is that you can set direction in the project by changing what's easy rather than, rather than just by using force, let's say. So the structure of this talk is I will give you a brief introduction to economics maybe, and then I'll tell you about three stories in Debian, uh, cdn.debian.net, the Darth of web app packages, although if there are people working on web app packaging, please accept my apologies, but I think this is a useful thing to look into, and reproducible builds. So I'll begin by introducing economics uh, in very, very quickly. Uh, so this is a, the briefest economics 101 you've ever seen. Um, in general, people take actions because they, they have some motivation. Uh, normally in like economics in class, that's because you pay them something. In Debian, people have some motivation. And it's not super important to me for this talk what people's motivations are, but I know that people have motivations to work on Debian. After all, we spend our time on this, which we could be spending on something else. Uh, for me, my motivation is that I, I just think Debian is really cool, and I feel cooler if I'm working on it. And uh, I'm also, there's a, when we talk about motivation in free software, we often talk about burnout. I'm not gonna talk a lot about burnout. Instead, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about the gap in between motivation and burnout, sort of normal contribution when people are just effectively working on things successfully. Uh, so in economics, then, there's this concept of, of uh, demand. So if I were to offer to pay you all a dollar and you would give me a pen, maybe some of you would. If I would increase that price to $100, possibly more of you would give me a pen. Uh, there's some graph that looks like this that economists like to show. Uh, inversely, if I wanted to sell a pen um, and I said, okay, here's a pen, not yours. I don't want to just take your things and sell them. Um, here's a pen. Uh, okay, perfect, thank you. Right. Uh, if I were to offer to sell them for $100, probably very few of you would buy them. And if I were to decrease that price, more of you might buy them. And in sort of normal price-based economics, you have a graph that looks like this. The intersection of those two charts is this sort of realistic price in the middle. Um, capitalism basically works for pens. Economic theory probably basically works for planning pens. And to the extent that it does, it's because these are what's called rival goods. So if I have a pen, and you want a pen, and we both want to use pens, we can't both use the same pen at the same time. In that sense, they are rival. Our needs can't be met by the same item, and so we'll, each of us will probably pay. Uh, volunteer labor and free software doesn't work that way, so you know, if I install the LibreOffice package, you can install the LibreOffice package. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. Um, so this brings me to my note-taking exercise. Actually, there is no note-taking exercise, sorry. I just wanted to demonstrate that people do volunteer to do things. Uh, the point is that there really, there really is motivation in people to, so thanks, I can give this back to you. <laughs> um, there really is motivation by people to do things for the public good. 
Uh, and, and so we might think that then there must be no scarcity. Um, but there is, of course. The, in economics, there's this definition of scarcity that people have unlimited wants and resources are limited. This is my favorite sentence in economics. Uh, and because there's no prices, because there's no money changing hands, it might seem like there is no limit on our resources. But there, there must be, because there's things I want in Debian that don't exist yet. So, uh, in the end, people trade their time away in the other things they could spend their life on to help out in Debian. And so, I don't, need to, I don't want to spend the rest of this talk harping on the why people do that, but I think it's really essential that whenever you want people to do things in Debian, that you make sure that you make sure that the, whatever their motivations are, that you can align what you're asking them to do with those existing motivations. So I'll skip this. Uh, so the first story is cdn.debian.net versus http.debian.net. So how many of you know about cdn.debian.net? Probably many of us. Yeah, great. Uh, how many of us know that cdn.debian.net was superseded by HTTP Reader? Cool. Uh, and how many of you could explain why? So I think the story is really interesting. Um, of course, it's about mirrors. There's ftp.debian.org. There's people who run mirrors. I used to run that mirror there, mirrors.acm.jhu.edu. I set it up 10 years ago when I was a student at Hopkins, which is Johns Hopkins University, uh, for two reasons. One is I wanted package downloads to be faster. And the other is, wouldn't it be cool if something I made was in Debian in the mirror list? How cool would that be? So I made it, and eventually now it's in the mirror list. Uh, so the way that mirrors work in Debian, generally speaking, leaving aside the newfangled CDN and HTTP reader stuff, is that every user picks what mirror to use. So if you guess during the installer that it takes people about half a minute to figure out what mirror to use, and you optimistically decide there are 10 million installs per year, then there's about 10 human years that people spend every year picking mirrors. And I could sort of cynically say, it's like we're killing 10 people every year, because we're taking their life away in aggregate 10 of those years. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that sounds pretty bad. And uh, you, we could, some, someone here who doesn't like Debian could go tweet and quote me on that and then say how bad Debian is. Uh, and so the thing that you might want to do then is remove that selector. But of course, that's not necessarily the best way to do it, because then people will spend half a minute every time they install something. And if you imagine that they install things 10 times a year, that's, 100, that's 10 times as much waste as if we never ask them at all. Uh, and so this, the point of this here is that we, there are trade-offs between different ways to solve these problems. Um, just because something is bad doesn't mean that removing it is good, I guess. Uh, so it would be nice if Debian users didn't have to pick which mirror they were using. And uh, five-ish years ago, some people put together cdn.debian.net. And I love the way cdn.debian.net works. It's sort of like a, a riddle. The idea of this service is that you do a DNS lookup, and that DNS lookup goes up through your ISP to the cdn.debian.net DNS servers. and based on which ISP is asking for the IP address of cdn.debian.net, it'll answer with a mirror that is supposedly near that ISP. Um, so this is the same trick that all content delivery networks use. It was sort of pioneered by Akamai in the 90s. And uh, it's, generally speaking, very effective. It's nice that if you're in Australia, for example, you don't have to reconfigure your laptop. It'll happen, this will happen automatically. Um, but the downside to the way this works, well, so in, it works not just, it, when you connect to that IP address, you have to tell it the HTTP host you're trying to connect to, which would be cdn.debian.net. The thing about that, it uses HTTP name-based virtual hosts. Uh, so in order for the cdn.debian.net service to add a new mirror, the mirror operator has to add a line in their Nginx or Apache conf that their mirrors host also accepts this other host header, cdn.debian.net. So this seems like it would be a very small ask, but in fact, I had, uh, 10 years ago, I started running this mirror. Here I am today. In all of that time, 
I never configured cdn.debian.net support on my mirror. And sorry to the nice people who made cdn.debian.net, but the reason is the motivation I had for running the mirror. So I wanted to run it so that you know, I could be cool and have my name basically in the list of Debian mirrors, and uh, I wanted faster downloads when I was living in Baltimore, which is where the JHU ACM is, uh, but I don't live in Baltimore anymore, so I have no motivation to continue maintaining that thing. Uh, it works fine, I handed it off to the rest of the computer club, they maintain it, but they don't even know about cdn.debian.net. I could have told them, I just didn't, because it didn't affect me. Uh, I wasn't motivated to. So the trick of HTTP.debian.net, which became HTTP Reader, is that it does HTTP redirects instead of doing a complicated DNS trick. Um, so when you request some package, when you do a wget, say, of HTTP.debian.net slash something, it says uh, 301 found, go look on this other server, maybe mirrors.acm.jhu.edu. And so the other servers don't have to know that they're receiving these requests because of http.debian.net. And so the maintainers of http.debian.net can just keep adding mirrors without any of the mirror operators having to do any work. And the key lesson there is that synchronized action comes at a cost. In the end, cdn.debian.net went away and HTTP Reader is now an official service. And it's because it's easy to add mirrors without asking anyone to help. Uh, but uh, interestingly, HTTP.debian.net is very slightly slower than CDN.debian.net in the median case, because you always have to do this redirect. But this technologically suboptimal outcome is actually sort of a community optimal outcome, because it requires the least collaboration, uh, sorry, yeah, the least collaboration among people. So David Eves has some terminology for this, which is that if you are asking people to do something and they need your, they, and you both need to approve it before it goes forward, that's collaboration. And a cooperation is when you can do something and build on top of someone else's work and you don't need to communicate. And in Debian, where possible, if we, if we can achieve good outcomes through cooperation, not collaboration, it's so much easier. And cooperations are so much cheaper that cdn.debian.net lost which is fine, we have a nice service now, and cdn.debian.net redirects to HTTP, Debian.net, so no one's harmed or anything. So that's the end of story one, uh, this distinction of collaboration versus cooperation. Story two is the question of web apps and Debian. So uh, maybe I can get a show of hands. How many people here run WordPress either for yourselves or for a friend? I know I do. Okay, great, keep your hands up. And now, how many of you are using the Debian package for WordPress? Ooh, wow, wow, okay. Like, maybe 15%. Uh, that's actually more than I expected. But the other 85% of us don't, and I think this suggests there's something wrong we're doing with the way web apps get packaged in Debian. Uh, of course, I'm kind of biased because I work on a different web app packaging project, but I hope that the suggestions of the problems are useful. So I want to tell you a story not about web apps, but about Alpine. So I maintain this program called Alpine. It's uh, Mail reader, it looks like this. And the reason I maintain it is that in 2006, Alpine was released, and it was released as 0 0.80 beta. And I thought a few things. I would love it if I were the person maintaining Alpine and Debian. And also, I want to upgrade to 0 0.81 when it comes out. So I want to make a package on my own machine so that when 0.81 comes out, I can update to that very easily. And the Debian package format is super easy for that. So it made sense for me to make that package for myself, and it was only a small marginal cost to share that package with the rest of Debian. And I think if we think about the incentives of package maintainers, uh, once I had made this thing and I wanted to share it, I also wanted that to be a good package, and so I asked people to review it, and now many people use Alpine on their Debian systems. I think I looked at PopCon and 1.74% of Debian systems have Alpine, which is kind of amazingly high. I don't know what they're all doing. <laughs> uh, but I could use it myself immediately, so it was a useful thing to make that package. Um, the, the interesting thing is if I really cared about Alpine users, I would be the Fedora maintainer of Alpine too. I would be distributing Windows binaries too, but I'm not. 
And it's because I'm not really an altruist who loves Alpine and wants everyone to use Alpine. I just wanted it to be easy to upgrade on my laptop and the other th and the, some computers in the computer club. And then from there, it was a small step to jump up to maintaining it for all of Debian. So I think the question for web app packaging is how do we align these incentives so that the way that we make web app packages is very similar to the way that people want to install them on their own machines. If we can get that right, then I think we'll have many more useful web app packages in Debian. And uh, there is, uh, there's an economic term for some of this, which is positive externalities, which is the idea that I'm doing something and it just happens to benefit other people who weren't part of the transaction. Um, the, another great example of positive externalities is when the government makes parks. People go to parks, they bring their friends to parks, they all have a nice time, no money changes hands. Uh, but I'm only going to do this if the value of making that package is greater than the cost of doing it. And I hope that we can bridge this gap because there's lots of great open source web apps that aren't packaged. There's EtherCalc, there's HLedgerWeb, uh, web-based nerdy accounting, uh, there's Lime Survey, all these great things. So that's lesson two, that we're not altruists. Lesson three, well, story three is about reproducible builds. So Lunar is in the room. I hope I get my story right. Uh, so uh, you all know that the point of binary reproducible builds is that we want a Debian package to be verifiable by some external party so that we can then check if the buildies have been compromised, we can know. Uh, and, um, and reproducible builds, it seems surprisingly hard because the tool chains for building things just weren't designed this way. And so most programs don't compile the same way twice. Uh, and Lunar talked a lot more about this earlier, but to summarize just one aspect of it, if you look at a gzip file, you will discover that it has the timestamp of its compression. So uh, two years ago at DebConf, Lunar and I were talking, and he was saying, wouldn't it be great if Debian had binary reproducible builds? That was two years ago, summer 2013, right around the time the Snowden leaks were happening. And wouldn't it be great if Debian were a trustworthy operating system in that way that anyone could verify? And unfortunately, Lunar said, the problem is too technically complex. There's too many things to fix. There's no way I'll convince a 1,000 maintainers to fix their packages. And I said, it's both a technical problem and a social problem. People think the cost is really high to them. And so they're not going to do it because the cost is greater than the value for that developer, that individual developer. Uh, so I figured the best thing we could do is make a convincing demo. Take like some package somewhere, make it build reproducibly, pump, punch out this timestamp, and uh, make a team around it. So Lunar then organized a boff two years ago at DebConf, and I think, I don't know, 30 people came? It was huge, I remember, yeah. Um, and the idea was we needed to research together what things made packages non-reproducible. And there was, became a wiki page that anybody could add to, and people did. They independently researched parts of it, cooperation, not collaboration. And uh, also around that time, I sort of vanished from the project, got a new job at Eventbrite, and uh, luckily other people picked up the work, and I kind of haven't done anything for it since. But I can at least take credit for smiling at Lunar at the right time. <laughs> and uh, what ended up happening was that there's only there's a small number of layers where work has to occur in order to get a huge benefit. And those layers can be done cooper fixed cooperatively, not collaboratively. And in the first experiments, all it took to get 62% of the archive reproducible was fixing just a small number of packages. And these three packages let you reproduce more than half of the archive. And what's funny about this is looking at the mailing list posts from the past where people say, yeah, it's too much work. So in 2007, somebody says, I see no benefit. Someone else says, I, for one, think this is technically infeasible. But interestingly, in 2013, the value maybe increased because we saw documents from the NSA that said things like they were attacking macOS dev tools, they meaning the NSA, Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, so luckily, the value is increasing. But Lunar managed to decrease the cost also. And the whole project of reproducible builds is about people, to a large extent, there's sort of two kinds of fixes to reproducible builds problems. There's fix the tooling and fix the package. And to the extent that fix the tooling works, it means that the maintainer gets this cool thing for free. So of course the cost is greater than the value because the cost is nothing. 
So uh, the other, th and you can see that in, their, in the monthly reports. So this is a quote from one of them. Um, Due to changes in the build dependencies, these 32 packages became reproducible. We never had to bug the maintainer. We just fixed it for them. Uh, that is efficient work. So I want to sort of highlight uh, how efficient the reproducible builds project has been. And uh, now it's around 80%, I think, of packages that build reproducibly, maybe a few more. One thing I got wrong is that I said there would be about maybe 12 or 20 types of issues. I think there are 132 kinds of non-reproducible aspects found, so uh, I got that one technical thing wrong when I smiled at Lunar two years ago. But, but the big lesson here is that you can set direction in Debian not so much by telling people, not just by telling people to do things, but by changing what's easy in the project. And that's sort of the lesson of Debian policy, but it took me a while to understand how powerful that is. So that's about the time I have. Uh, there's three takeaways then. Uh, consider cooperation over collaboration. Remember that we're not altruists, and you can set direction by changing what's easy. So thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, a question, great. Um, I'd like to rephrase on this altruist um, argument. I am also often frequently uh, addressed as an altruist. I think I am, but I have also non-altruistic motivations to work on uh, Debian, right, like this. Right. I just think it's so interesting that I don't maintain Alpine and Fedora. Like, why don't I care even that much about Alpine users? It's not easy for you. Right, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so I, I, I actually love the collaboration versus cooperation, but that's also why DevConf is so valuable, is because it's time for collaboration. Yes, yes, exactly. The, you can only get so far with just plain cooperation, um, so, yeah. It's also exactly how Debian has grown. Um, you know, the very simple fact that over the years we've had th thousands of people all maintaining their individual packages. They don't have to collaborate every day. They can just go away and do their own pieces. It works well. Exactly. Yeah, I kind of proposed this talk to Open Source Bridge because I wanted to basically say, hey, you new, hip, open source people, Debian has something it can teach you. So yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I do notice that you smile a lot. Um, so that might increase the odds of having an opportunistic smile. Um, <laughs> And I'm also curious if you have any uh, ideas of what might be another easy thing we could change that makes a big impact. When you say another, are you saying that the first one is smiling? I'm not sure I understand. Because <laughs> the, the, the thing, the com that, that was mostly a joke, because the thing I said with Lunar wasn't just like a smile, it was, it's a technical problem as well as a social problem, and you can decrease the perceived cost by demonstrating that it'll be easy. Uh, and I mean, just the, the release team already understands this, and they, they talk about setting smart goals, specific, measurable, actionable, R and T, timely goals. Basically, that if you're proposing a really, something that everyone in Debian needs to do, you need to be able to figure out if it's actually been done, like successfully been done by the end. Um, Uh, so when you say one other thing, are you saying that reproducible build is the thing, or that smiling is the thing, or? Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I think that if there is one thing, it's getting people to talk to each other and find out which parts of their work they could think about differently in order to have them be easier. And that's something we could all do peer to peer. So, you know, after this talk, find someone in the hall and ask them, what are you working on? And why is it hard? And how, maybe how can we make it more, more around cooperation and less around collaboration? 
And things like the Perl team's work on having very standardized processes emphasize cooperation. Maybe we can do that for people's individual packages too. Uh, I know that Odix was telling me that the, print, the printing team, he likes to say the printing team because it's basically him, uh, actually appears to have grown and has a new member. And somebody just showed up to the bug tracker and has been triaging printing bugs. Um, and maybe there's just a request for help where people can take actions that don't need anybody's approval to merge them. And we can just make more of these requests. Thanks for your attention. Um, the talk time is over. And see you in a bit for the next talk. Thanks.